And now there's a section that I'm moving forward to. And this section is called the stench of battle. The sun bore down on us like a giant heat lamp. Occasional rains fell on the hot coral, merely evaporated like steam off hot pavement. The air hung heavy and muggy. Everywhere we went on the ridges, the hot, humid air reeked with the stench of death. A strong wind was no relief. It simply brought the horrid odor from an adjacent area. Japanese corpses lay where they fell among the rocks and on the slopes. It was impossible to cover them. Usually there was no soil that could be spaded over them, just the hard, jagged coral. The enemy dead simply rotted where they had fallen. They lay all over the place in grotesque positions with puffy faces and grinning, buck-toothed expressions. It was difficult to convey to anyone who has not experienced it the ghastly horror of having your sense of smell saturated constantly with the putrid odor of rotting human flesh day after day, night after night. This was something the men of an infantry battalion got a horrifying dose of during the long, protracted battle such as Peleliu. In the tropics, the dead became bloated and gave off a terrific stench within a few hours after death. Whenever possible, we, rem we removed marine dead to the rear of the company's position. There they were usually laid on stretchers and covered with ponchos, which stretched over the head of the corpse down to the ankles. I rarely saw a dead marine left uncovered with his face exposed to the sun, rain, and flies. Somehow it seemed indecent not to cover our dead. Often, though, the dead might lie on the stretchers, for some time and decompose badly before the busy grave registration crews could take them for burial in the division cemetery near the airfield. Added to the awful stench of the dead of both sides was the repulsive odor of human excrement everywhere. It was all but impossible to practice simple elemental field sanitation on most areas of Peleliu because of the rocky surface. Field sanitation during maneuvers in combat was the responsibility of each man. In short, under normal conditions, he covered his own waist with a scoop of soil. At night, when he didn't dare venture out of his foxhole, he simply used an empty grenade canister or a ration cans and threw it out of his hole and scooped dirt over it the next day if he wasn't under enemy fire. That was not possible on Peleliu. Added to this was the odor of thousands of rotting, discarded Japanese and American rations. At every breath one inhaled, humid, air heavy with countless repulsive odors, I felt as though my lungs would never be cleansed of these foul vapors. As I looked on, at the stains on the coral, I recalled some of the eloquent phrases of politicians and newsmen about how gallant it was for a man to shed his blood for his country and to give life's blood for sacrifice, and so on. The words seemed so ridiculous. Only the flies benefited. So, as patriotic and brave as Eugene Sledge was, the madness the madness even made him begin to question what this was all about and think about what these politicians would say and say that only the flies benefited. Mm. It's crazy how he went so detailed in the, in the smells. Because, you know, when you watch movies and, and that's a part that you don't, you don't they get. touch on it every once in a while. Ooh, the, you know, the guy's covering his nose or something like that to indicate this smells bad. But that doesn't stick in your mind the whole time. No. Maybe if they add like flies or something, I don't know. Um, but how he, how he illustrated how this was going on to the point where I never even thought I'd ever catch a, a fresh breath. You know, basically mm -hmm. this is going to stay in. It really, 
adds that element of of hell, you yeah. know. And they say that smell is one of the most um, like impactful senses no you have that it. can that can like spark memories the no strongest, you know. It. No doubt about it. And there's there is a smell. There was a smell in Iraq. Obviously, it wasn't as bad as this, but it was. It's it's a it's a bad smell. Yeah, and for sure, when something hits me, if you're in a you know a strange place or a place where there's where it's not sanitary, you can get that momentary remembrance yeah. of that smell. Yeah. And this section called the stench of combat is beyond just the smell. Yeah. Which we'll get into now. The grinding stress of prolonged heavy combat, the loss of sleep because of night nightly infiltration raids, the vigorous physical demands forced on us by the rugged terrain and the unrelenting suffocating heat were enough to make us drop in our tracks. How we kept going and continued fighting, I'll never know. I was so indescribably weary physically and emotionally that I became fatalistic, praying only for my fate to be painless, thinking he's going to die. And his only prayer is that it's painless. Yeah, that's straight up believing it. Like, you know you're going to die. In addition to the terror and hardships of combat, each day brought some new dimension of dread for me. I witnessed some new, ghastly, macabre facet in the kaleidoscope of the unreal, as though designed by some fiendish ghoul to cause even the most hardened and calloused observer among us to recoil in horror and disbelief. Late one afternoon, a buddy and I returned from the gun pit in the fading light. We passed a shallow defilade we hadn't noticed previously. In it were three Marine dead. They were lying on stretchers where they had died before their comrades had been forced to withdraw some time earlier. As we moved past, my buddy groaned, Jesus. I took a quick glance into the depression and recoiled in revulsion and pity at what I saw. The bodies were so badly decomposed and nearly blackened by exposure. This was to be expected of the dead in the tropics, but these marines had been mutilated hideously by the enemy. One man had been decapitated. His head lay on his chest. His hands had been severed from his wrists and also lay on his chest near his chin. In disbelief, I stared at the face as I realized that the Japanese had cut off the dead Marine's penis and stuffed it into his mouth. The corpse next to him had been treated similarly. The third had been butchered, chopped up like a carcass torn apart by some predatory animal. My emotions solidified into rage and a hatred for the Japanese beyond anything I had ever experienced. From that moment on, I never felt the least pity or compassion for them, no matter what the circumstances. My comrades would field strip their packs and pockets for souvenirs and take gold teeth, but I never saw a Marine commit that kind of barbaric mutilation that the Japanese committed if they had access to our dead. Like I said, it's a glimpse into the darkest part of humanity. And I want people to think about that and remember that it's real. It's real. That dark part of humanity that we don't want to exist, it exists. Evil exists. And this is coming from a guy, you know, when he says that he never had any pity after this, this again, and you, if you go and watch the Pacific and you watch interviews with this guy, you can absolutely feel, like I said, the, the, the kindness oozes out of him. But even he 
when confronting the darkness had to explore his own darkness. Mm-hmm.